Hello, I'm Jonathan Graham. I'm a senior uh, system engineering undergraduate at George Mason University. I will be doing a quick little overview of our senior capstone project, which is the design of a single pilot cockpit for Allen Operations. My teammates were Chris Hopkins, Andrew Luber, and Soham Trevetti. So we'll start off with some context. Our scope that we're looking at for this research is um, large commercial air transportation, which we take uh, Bureau of Transportation Statistics, how they define that as uh, carriers that have more than $20 million in operating revenue in domestic operations, so it's the U.S. airspace, and we inflation adjust all of our dollar figures to $2012. dollars So this graph here shows our profit and loss for major carriers. Notice that up until about 2000, they were somewhat profitable. And then there's this period of bankruptcies and really up and down and profit and loss and net income. So we're all pretty unstable during this most recent period. And when you look at the operating expense, uh, you know, it's steadily rising here over the period of 1990 to 2012 and then projected to keep going. And of that operating expense, fuel really was the driver over the last decade and we're saying, or for our purposes, we're saying that fuel costs uh, are definitely more challenging to control than something like labor. So we are going to focus on labor. And pilot labor, though steady, was still some, a pretty large portion of that $100 billion or so operating expense. And in addition to that uh, cost figure is the fact that according to FAA, and some other reporting, there's an expected uh, pilot shortage in this commercial area. So you're having cost issues and you also might have a pilot shortage. So that drives kind of looking at a single pilot cockpit. Now on this slide, an interesting historical note is um, the going to demonstrate here is this, the historical devolution. So on the left, you start with five pilots. And then over time, certain technologies uh, eliminate the need for a pilot. So the radio operator goes, and then the navigator, the flight engineer, and now we're going to say, can we get rid of a co-pilot? Is there some technology, or is the safety of the aircraft good enough, or whatever the case is where you can have a single pilot. So our focus is going to be on the flight deck, and we isolate our, the two roles of these two pilots, where you have a pilot flying, a pilot not flying, also as a captain and a co-pilot, though pilot flying and pilot not flying are interchangeable, they're not static. And in general, due to flight, can, uh, flight requirements for certification by the FAA, you have to really um, balance these two roles between the co-pilot and captain, otherwise no one would ever really get trained. Um, also to note, yes, there are more than two pilots in certain aircraft. Usually we're going to say that that's the international flights, the larger planes where you actually have to have a rotating crew. That's out of our scope. Again, we're in the U.S. airspace. Um, so uh, looking at some of the cockpit avionics that are common, these are some of the technologies that eliminate the need for certain pilots. And what's governing these pilots in the cockpit are the flight procedures. For our purposes, we, look, we were able to obtain a BAE RJ100 uh, flight crew operating manual, which dictates uh, or has a section that tells all the standard operating procedures that a pilot flying and a pilot not flying are supposed to do. And for our analysis, we're going to look at how workload is affected whenever these procedures change under different system designs. So a procedure, um, as defined in that operating manual, is broken up into 63 different distinct procedures, and those are normal and abnormal procedures, which are then decomposed into 613 tasks, which we decompose further into specific actions, which characterize um, physical and mental actions that are required to accomplish that hierarchy of procedure tasks. Um, as an example procedure, here's an activity diagram or sequence diagram, sorry, where you have a pilot flying, the pilot not flying, the actual aircraft, so that would be really the cockpit part, and an air traffic control block. So the pilot flying, this is a wind shear detection procedure, by the way, the pilot flying starts by doing some physical instrument manipulation where he's pulling levers and pushing buttons, and then he does a verbal cockpit call out to the pilot not flying, who then is initiated to do 
more physical instrument manipulations with the aircraft, cockpit avionics, and then does a final report to ATC. So these terms I'm using, the instrument manipulation, cockpit callout, these are kind of our ontology that was developed to characterize these actions, so the lowest level interaction in the cockpit for our purposes. So going on in the stakeholder analysis, we've kind of grouped some of these uh, various high-level stakeholder groups. So you have regulatory agencies like the FAA, the aviation workforce, so pilot, pilot unions, air traffic control, their unions, the customer base, and then um, the aviation industry as a whole. So air carriers, the management of those air carriers, or airliners, if you will, manufacturers of the aircraft, insurance, airports, etc. And this nice graphic here to kind of describe some of those tensions that you have. So regulatory agencies would be pretty um, uh, hesitant to transition such a large overhaul in the air system to go from these two, three pilot cockpits down to one. And then pilots, of course, would be a little miffed at first because you might have issues with um, uh, perceived job threats, things like that. But again, there's a pilot shortage, so there might be one win there. Pilot unions, ALPA, um, the air traffic controllers, and their unions, Again, these kind of labor groups resistant to change. Your commercial air carriers, airline management, and your man your aviation industry overall might be willing to support something like a single pilot cockpit due to the potential market benefits uh, for reduced cost, increased um, sales for planes, things of that nature. Of course, there is a risk profile associated with that, so you got to get uh, regulatory and, and insurance companies things like that on board too so a lot of tensions going on but um, you know, will be addressed later with a win-win <clears throat> so into the classic problem need here the problem we have rising operating expense and overall financial stability profitability has been difficult to achieve and we have a pilot labor shortage so a notional gap here we look at the operating revenue and operating expense Back whenever there was profit in the industry, or a more consistent profit, between 1990 and 2000, you had this ratio above one. And, you know, it's basically common sense. If you make, if you bring in more money than you spend, then presumably you'll have a profit. And if you look past 2000, they've been below one or just at one. So our gap is trying to raise that ratio. So if you can decrease your cost and then allocate that somewhere else to increase revenue, then you can start driving pro uh, to more profit profitable industry. So the airlines will continue to have volatile financial performance and operating costs will just keep growing here. Um, fuel largely being the driver, but labor expense can be controlled a little better. Single pilot cockpit is needed to decrease the labor expense and mitigate the effect of a pilot shortage. So uh, there's a lot ahead of you with trying to satisfy all these different stakeholders and a win-win could possibly be the actual phase in of this technology versus just a like a light switch you go from two to one so notionally here we have a two pilot cockpit as we have today and then within five years you have some sort of two pilot cockpit with your alternative so you keep those two pilots there to evaluate it and you keep evaluating testing refining so very iterative and then you eventually transition to a single pilot cockpit so this gives you a lot of time to analyze and kind of satisfy a lot of these issues that these stakeholders would have. Some high-level mission requirements we've developed were for the procedure time, so we're going to put a boundary on their baseline procedure time. Um, reliability requirements and costs, you want to also you're concerned about safety, and then these and these values come from our analysis, which will be described further later. So into the design alternatives, first to start with the uh, we'll start with the physical process diagram. This is kind of where we branch our um, design alternatives from and we start with operating procedures which you know, have pilots that are kind of triggering these or not triggering these are mechanisms for the triggered flight goal and air traffic control so they're receiving commands and they're trying to hit a target goal and they're selecting these procedures and implementing them within your cockpit which are your avionics and then they're issuing aircraft control to the actual aircraft and you obtain your outcome or you have that feedback loop with that aircraft dynamics and you just keep doing this. So again, it's a kind of a steady state here. In our design alternatives, we'll basic two pilot notes. So this is the no change option. We just keep everything the way it is. 
Single pilot, no support, so it's just a lone guy flying. That's a picture of a U-2 cockpit, so very common in the military, but we'd be trying to do this for a commercial. And then a single pilot with onboard support system, so that is that single pilot who's flying, but he has some sort of avionics hardware. Um, you know, black box at this level, but it's there and it has some basic functionality that can handle some of the uh, workload that the co-pilot would have, or the pilot not flying would have. So how do we analyze all this? Um, first, we'll look at the three different, or the really high level overview here. We started with a uh, procedure simulation, which we start with that FCOM that was in the context, curve flight into Excel, converted into XML schema, which is actually served as the model input or the input for the simulation. And there's three different models that were generated for each alternative. So one for the two pilot, which is basically the manual. And then there were some rules of thumb developed to change how we um, eliminated some of the procedures for the, for the single pilot case and the single pilot with onboard support system. And that gets pumped into a Java simulation program, which underneath has that uh, has a model human processor, which is a Q network of different um, processing nodes that basically those actions all the way at the lowest level of our model um, get processed through, which I'll explain more in detail later there. But uh, below that, we have a reliability uh, modeling, which we start with reliability block diagrams and see what happens to the actual safety in the cockpit whenever you start uh, changing the serial and parallel configuration of the cockpit with the aircraft. So what happens when you remove a pilot or if you have a system that can take over for a pilot, things like that. And those two inputs get combined into a utility, which uh, will use a life cycle cost model to develop the savings potential for the alternatives and then eventually drive for a recommendation. To start with the procedure simulation, a lot of assumptions here. We start with the human model process, where this is going to approximate our actions in the cockpit under normal flight conditions. So this is best case scenario, you know, no pilot that's fatigued or he has something on his mind or whatever, he's optimal condition. The events are independent of each other, so they're not related in any way. If there's an issue with one, it's not going to carry over to the other. Normal flight conditions and expert skill level. Presumably pilots have to be experts to fly at a commercial level. They have a lot of flight experience and they have to be certified. So, um, And we assume the alternatives follow contemporary aviotics costs. So for that onboard support system, it's not going to be absorbently expensive. It should be um, relative to a, a similar system that does similar functionality, or not functionality, but complexity. Um, the RJ100 is representative of similar operating manuals, of course. Not all of them are the same. If you have a 737 or 757, uh, they're going to be different, but we're going to say that this approximates most of them. And the procedures in these manual are complete representation of normal or of, of flight. Additional company-specific pilot tasks, which are very common, are not included in the manual, and therefore are included in the analysis. So for inputs, again, kind of driving the point home, we started with that standardized operating manual, and then broke it down into this XML model, which gets parsed into the simulation and is uh, processed according to the model human processor, which, which is a network that breaks up into, uh, or a, a high level network broken into perception, cognition, and, and motor with a lot of pieces below that, some network pieces that kind of make up some of the um, ins and outs of each of those higher level um, so grounded in a lot of human factors research, so if you're familiar with this area, like ACTAR, GOMS, FITZLAW, a lot of these pieces are kind of placed up in there. And we add our own block for um, a processing time for that for avionics. And this is just kind of a little mini animation. So over on the left you have that tree, that would be the XML, and then action comes in and gets processed by the perception and then goes through cognition and then hits the motor if applicable. So for instance, if he's playing with an instrument and these get summed up and you'll get an actual processing time for that action, which then those sum of actions get summed up to the sum of tasks, which eventually you'll get an actual procedure time. And these are the equations that are used. So some of various distributions for various sub network nodes and then these are just summed up in a Monte Carlo-like fashion, and you'll get a uh, uh, processing time for each procedure 
And uh, for analysis, we're going to look at if there is a difference, statistical difference in our two pilot case, and then what's the workload. So workload is a ratio for um, the procedure, the, so discrete individual procedure time uh, compared to the two pilot procedure time. So if it's greater than one, then it took more time for another pilot to fly than the, than the two pilot, pilot to fly. In the design of experiment, we have our input, which again is the, are those three different models which have different tasks. They're manipulated based on the capabilities of each design alternative. We add an additional processing node for the onboard support system, and then our output will be workload and processing time. Coming over to reliability modeling, we looked at um, what is the safety, baseline safety in uh, the airspace system now. NTSB uh, um, puts out uh, some data, and, and based on that, there's about 2.2 accidents a year on average from 1993 to 2012 time period, with an average of 14 million or so um, flight hours a year. And we treat that as a failure rate, so two, you know, 2.2 on average 2.2 divided by 14 and then you'll get your um, failure rate and then we'll convert that to a per hour basis and then use that in reliability block diagrams to see what happens uh, for your basically your space of um, allowable failure so what can you certify to to meet a certain reliability requirement which um, I might have skipped over in the previous slide but at 1 million, at 1 million flight hours which we fix in our analysis is 0.8674, so there's a 86% chance you can continue flying at a million flight hours without actually having an accident in the airspace system. And a major accident is defined as a uh, loss of life or a catastrophic loss of all aircraft. Load. So on the left-hand side, you have a two-pilot cockpit. In parallel, you have a pilot and a co-pilot. If one has is incapacitated, the other can continue to fly the aircraft. And the aircraft is, of course, you know whatever its pieces. Um, and serial with that cockpit. A single pilot though, if he goes, then it all goes. So it's a serial uh, reliability. The onboard support system, we're gonna say that it has a functionality or capability where it can actually uh, support a pilot incapacitation event where there's either a ground trigger or a, uh, another person on the plane can trigger an emergency auto land or auto transition effect again really high level assumption but we don't think it's out of the scope of possibility given the current UAS uh, capability with a lot of military hardware and even civilian hardware at this point. Um, so design of experiment we basically varied the failure rates from 101 and 100,000 uh, to 1 in 10 million hours you have a catastrophic failure in one of these components and then see where you have to be to meet that 0 0.6674 system reliability and system retreating as you know the airspace system so we're not talking to individual aircraft here, we're talking over your entire system. What are you dealing with? And then the output, those are your um, uh, your output equations. In the business case, we developed the life cycle cost model for 25 years. We looked at data for 737 out of 441 filings from the Department of Transportation and used the average pilot labor cost and um, and uh, so basically a, a starting acquisition, a salvage, at 25% of the acquisition, which really isn't too important because we're really looking at the pilot labor and um, what happens when you remove a pilot. So what is your life cycle savings? So you have a, a life cycle cost and then you have a net savings. So the savings would be the difference between the two pilot case and then the one pilot case. And basically whatever you save over that life cycle you'll have to invest in other areas or into that other alternative, the onboard support system, on a per aircraft basis. And then we include an escalation term because presumably supply and demand, if you have a shortage of pilots, you'll have an increase in the cost for pilots. Um, so that's in there to see, uh, give you some range, given a barrier rate and given an escalation rate, what, what are you looking at in terms of um, cost savings? And then here's the design of experiment. Uh, what we vary and we'll go in more detail in the results section. A value hierarchy was generated, so our outputs populate this from each analysis that's in red. Blue would be ideally where you would look at um, going forward, but for now red is what's in scope. In the results, so in the procedure simulation, um, this is just a sample here in that graphic of the procedure times, the average procedure times, just a small little sample for 10 different procedures. 
the two pilot obviously had longer times because it was more interaction in the cockpit took longer to, or, or more actions to complete before you can complete the procedure single pilot uh, had less because you're actually eliminating a lot of the time with interacting with another pilot and kind of the back and forth there and the pilot support was kind of close in most cases but um, usually uh, came came in in, uh, in second with regard to you know, least time to most time uh, but both had a significant difference you know p basically zero and uh, the takeaways the, the time the pilot spends performing tasks decreases because you know as was it, as predicted you would eliminate tasks from that procedure tree then you'll have less time uh, no distributions can be fitted to the to the you know, this is a histogram here of the procedure times but there's some population parameter or uh, sorry sample statistics there so you mean median standard deviation as for the workload, the workload for single pilot was significantly higher, about 4.17, compared to the um, onboard support system that had actually reduced workload per our analysis. So the takeaway here is that, uh, oh, in the, uh, uh, yeah, so, so the takeaway here is that you have an increased workload on the single pilot. So he's working faster, but he's working harder. So there's some implications there where you might have issues with um, error rate might peak and his exhaustion might start going up. So a lot of human factors implications there, which would require further analysis with live subjects. When the reliability we looked at, um, you'd have to have one failure in every 23 million flight hours for the single pilot case, which doesn't really work with the current flight safety. So we deem that as infeasible. Um, if you can certify your avionics uh, to a reasonable, you know, million plus fail or one in a million plus failure rate then uh, you should be good when you have a pilot flying with it so we we judge that as being feasible uh, the single pilot savings are best case you'd have 4.38 million dollars per aircraft which you could invest or allocate other where or to other areas and um, worst case you would have 100k so that's really a business decision this should be extended further on a per airline basis and you can add in more uh, deeper research such as uh, maybe efficiencies in fuel or um, maintenance things like that but for now it's just high level best worst not too bad uh, utility we looked at instead of going in and, and, and doing surveys and things like that just looking at starting with sensitivity analysis where if you max each attribute uh, where do you end up for the alternatives and really you never uh, do well with the single pilot unless you look at procedure time which even then it's marginally better um, in, ter in, ter in terms of uh, in terms of value there so for the most part you're going to win with the two pilot in the single pilot onboard support and the onboard support would potentially have savings so um, We'll get into that with recommendations. So with requirements that we had at the beginning, we see we satisfy them with the onboard support system and we don't with the single because of the uh, safety implications to reliability. Um, for, so for a recommendation, our utility ranking, we have the two pilot, then the single pilot onboard and single pilot. Uh, the single pilot has cost reductions, but the workload of safety bounds uh, overall the utility there. And the safety mechanism for pilot would give alternative increased utility if you actually add that in, which is basically our onboard support system. So we would recommend to actually implement or go forward with using the onboard, the single pilot with an onboard support system. And here comes back that win-win. If you can evolve that design and integration in over that win-win period, uh, could be a success for regulatory body, consumer, labor, you know, all those stakeholders. So of course, this is very infant research and it'd be good to actually tie this into a live simulator and see a lot of those human factor implications and um, kind of work this over with stakeholders and things like that and see what they actually think about the idea of flying with one pilot and start actually working on an onboard support design so not just treat it as a black box but design a requirements baseline that you can flow down and uh, start designing hardware and, 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 and seeing if you can realize cost savings or do some of these assume uh, take over, cap failover capabilities. And thank you.